So I think we are at 115. I'm just going to take a quick look and see if folks are back. Just make sure that we're starting on time. I see many cameras on. Welcome back. I hope that lunch was pleasant, was very efficient, but I hope that everyone had a chance to kind of step away. Uh, I'm really excited and pleased to build on a topic that actually we started this morning, which Sarah Boding mentioned uh, that at Pacha, we've added a new subcommittee, a very important subcommittee on aging with HIV, long-term and lifetime survivors. Addressing aging with HIV, including for long-term and lifetime survivors, is critical to providing holistic and effective health care, otherwise known as whole person care, which we've been talking about in the terrific panel that preceded uh, what we're going to be talking about now. Uh, we know that whole person care addresses behavioral health challenges, mental health, uh, broadly it combats stigma, and it also ensures that individuals can age with dignity and with a high quality of life while uh, thriving with HIV. It requires a multifaceted approach that involves healthcare providers, policymakers, researchers, and our entire uh, broader community. And with that, I'm really excited about uh, this next panel. And I'd like to invite the subcommittee co-chairs, Alicia Diggs and Jesse Mylan to lead the next panel discussion. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much, Vincent. And thank you, Marlene. Thank you both for your leadership and congratulations, Vincent and Marlene. We're so glad to have you back in the saddle. Alicia and I are thrilled to be working together on this new subcommittee of PACHA on HIV and aging for long-term and lifetime survivors. It's the first time that Lisa and I have had a chance to work together, and we've already started having a lot of fun. But I think it's important for us to perhaps connect the, the, the dots for this committee, not just to the segment that we just heard, but to how we started today's PACHA meeting in commemorating World AIDS Day. The 36 million people who have died worldwide from AIDS and the 700,000 Americans who have died from AIDS would consider this committee a miracle, literally a miracle, because whether you're 25 and you've lived with HIV since the day you were born, or you're 65 and you're now aging with HIV and looking at retirement, it feels like a miracle. And that miracle is due to the advocacy that our community has done over these more than 40 years to make it possible for people to live a long and healthy life, and to the research that's been done that has made antiretrovirals easier to take, even possible, and easier and easier to take. But that miracle is not done. Just because you might be 25 or 65 is not the end of the story, because for all of us, whether we were in, uh, acquired HIV at birth or whether we acquired HIV sometime along our life cycle, our goal is to get to 80. Our goal is to get to 90. Our goal is to get beyond. You know, we've had some beautiful and important people who have died recently including a former first lady who died at age 96, a former president who's 100, a former secretary of state who's 100. Why can't we live that long? Well, that's what this is about. Our goal is to live a long and healthy life. And we know that nationally, 50% of all people living with HIV have now reached the age of 50 and older. But we also have thousands of people who were born with HIV who are now, as we've heard from that last segment, reaching age 30. And soon, hopefully, they will live to be 40 and beyond. But what are the issues that we're facing? What are the issues that we're facing medically? What are the issues we're facing mentally? What are the issues we're facing socially and financially? Those are the issues that we want to look at as PACHA members as we address the issue of HIV and aging. And we brought some wonderful panelists to our meeting today. We've divided our panel into three segments. The first segment will look at the medical issues and the comorbidities that people living with HIV for a long time are facing. The second panel a segment will be hearing the voices of lived experience from the community, from both dandelions and from people people who have been living with HIV since acquiring it in adulthood. And then the third panelist will be uh, giving us a guidance on what we should know on a policy front that Patrick can do to take action to make sure that from a federal and possibly even from a state and local level, what is needed for advancing our HIV and aging care so that we live long and healthy lives. Alicia, anything you'd like to add in terms of framing this important panel? 
Absolutely. Thank you, Jesse. And thank you, everyone that's here today. Um, I would just like to mention that HIV and aging has been a topic that Pacha has talked about for a while. So as a member of NHAN or NMAX National HIV and AIDS Aging Network, which is a network of individuals advocating for collective interests as persons aging with HIV. I'm so very excited to work alongside with Jesse Milan as co-chairs for this new Aging and HIV and Long-Term and Lifetime Survivors Committee. I would like to briefly share um, some stats that indicate of the 1.4 million people living with HIV in the United States, 50% are are 50 years of age and older. And by 2030, people living with HIV 50 years and older will constitute 70% of the individuals living with HIV in the United States, but also who have those who have been perinatally acquired HIV at birth or at a very young age have been living with HIV for decades longer than those who did not acquire HIV at a young age or at birth. Therefore, this conversation about HIV and aging would not serve its purpose without including that population. And finally, clinical data suggests that aging with HIV will become a significant public health challenge to address federal, state, and local levels. So with that being said, this is an opportunity for us to discuss this topic. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. As I mentioned in my introduction, when we did the roll call, I've been living with HIV myself now for 41 years. So for me, and I think for just about every member of Pacha, this is both a personal and professional issue. And we're going to start with the first segment. I said we'd start with the clinical uh, understandings as a grounding for all of us. Then we'll move to the community. And then we will ask Ronald Johnson to give us the policy agenda for people aging and, and living long time with HIV. So I'm very pleased to introduce someone that I have known for quite some time and I admire greatly, Dr. Jeffrey Kwong. Dr. Kwong is a doctor of nurse practitioner. He is a professor at the uh, Rutgers School of Nursing where he specializes in gerontology and HIV AIDS. He's had over 26 years as a leader specializing in LBGTQ care and HIV care. He has been the co-director of, Amer of the American Academy in HIV Medicines, HIV and Aging Initiative, and also he's on the advisory council for, for the HIV and Aging Initiative at the Association of Nurses and AIDS Care. Jeffrey is also a past president of ANAC, um, and I can tell you that he's one of the most brilliant minds and the most caring and compassionate for practitioners in our field. So Dr. Kwong, Jeffrey, would you please give us an overview of the issues that people living with and aging with HIV face and then we'll have a few moments for Q&A with you then. At the end of all three segments, we'll have time for Q&A for all Pacha members with all, all, the, all of our panelists for today. Marlene, I think we have some feedback coming from someone. Can we ask them to turn their mic to mute? Yeah, absolutely. I know HHS Studios is on the line monitoring, so hopefully we will get that resolved. Thank you, Jeff. All right. So, Dr. Kong, I think you have some slides for us, and we're turning the floor over to you for the next 20 minutes. Wonderful. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Jesse, for that uh, very uh, warm welcome, and hello, and thank you to all the members of Pacha and all of the audience here. It is truly an honor to be a part of this meeting and to uh, start off this segment. So, my goal in the next 50 to 20 minutes is really just sort of, again, as Jesse mentioned, lay the foundation for some of the clinical issues, some of which many of you may know already, but just to sort of highlight them and then to really uh, lead from clinical to uh, our next presenters and panelists who will talk about more of the lived experience and also some policy issues. So hopefully we'll get that started here. So uh, next slide, please. Thank you so much. So this has already been stated as part of the introductory uh, introduction, but as we know, with the availability of effective antiretroviral therapy, many individuals are now um, living into their 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and beyond. And as data has shown, currently the current estimates are that about half the people living with HIV at this current time 
are 50 years or older, and in the next decade, that percentage will increase to um, over 70% of people being 50 years or older living with HIV by 2030 or so. Next slide, please. And what are the main clinical issues that we're seeing? So really the, the things that are from a medical or clinical aspect are really the issues of comorbidities. And we have known this for many years, that individuals living with HIV experience other chronic conditions or comorbidities at earlier ages. And as time progresses, those comorbidities accumulate over time. And so here, this is some data that was just presented or published earlier this year in JAMA that looked at data from two large cohort studies that many of you may be familiar with. One is the WISE cohort or the Women's Interagency HIV study, and the other one is the MAX uh, cohort study. And you can see here, and I'll, I'm just going to have you sort of focus in on sort of the darker turquoise um, sections, that at each decade interval, beginning at 40 through over 70, you can see that the proportion of darker turquoise or darker blue increases with each decade. And uh, that darker blue actually represents five or more comorbidities. And these are other conditions such as heart disease, metabolic disorders such as diabetes, or other conditions as well. And so you can see here, this analysis actually showed that, in fact, um, with the most recent data, that there may be some uh, differences not only by age, but also by gender. And um, here in this analysis, they show that women actually experience multiple comorbidities more than men in, um, in their analysis. Next uh, slide, please. So cardiovascular disease, the number one cause of mortality, regardless of HIV status. So this is one of the leading causes of uh, morbidity and mortality for individuals as they age. And we see in the uh, in persons with HIV, that there is a twofold increase of cardiovascular disease um, compared to those without. And the global burden of this has increased to nearly three times um, over the last two decades. Next slide, please. With regards to diabetes, another common co-occurring condition, we see that the overall prevalence nearly double uh, in persons with HIV compared to those without. Next slide, please. What about some of the other ones that we think about as people um, age, so uh, such as cognitive issues. So there was a very recent analysis that was just published looking at Alzheimer's disease and Alzheimer's related dementias occurring at nearly twice the rate in persons with HIV who are aging compared to those without and also at an earlier age. Um, the average age is around 65 versus 75 in persons without HIV. We see uh, rates of kidney disease also occurring at much higher rates and cancers and malignancies such as lung cancer and HPV related anal cancers occurring at two to three times the rate in persons uh, with HIV compared to those without. Next slide, please. Now, something that we don't necessarily always think about when we think about sort of chronic conditions, but this is something that um, as the folks in the um, gerontology field think about is the issue of frailty or pre-frailty. So frailty is really a multifactorial condition that um, may not necessarily be tied to say heart disease alone or diabetes, but really can contribute to uh, or can be caused by many things and can lead to changes in overall function and quality of life. So here, this is um, an analysis that was presented uh, or published by a colleague, Meredith Green out of San Francisco, looking at her population and the um, at San Francisco General. And you can see here just by sort of the overall frequency, although um, the number of individuals who met the true definition of frailty was about uh, 9%, individuals who met the criteria for pre-frailty, that means one or more of the conditions, um, almost half of the population had evidence or had signs or symptoms of pre-frailty. And again, this is associated with increased risk of poor health, disability, hospitalization, and death as well. Next slide, please. But when we think about aging and HIV, what are the causes and what are the factors? There's been a lot of research and there are many factors that contribute to to this, um, to this issue. So part of it is HIV itself. So we know that even in the setting of well-controlled HIV, when somebody is on antiretroviral therapy and their viral load may be undetectable, at the cellular 
cellular level, there is still ongoing inflammation, which can lead to um, the development of other comorbidities or other conditions such as heart disease, diabetes. We also know that there are social and environmental factors and uh, other socially determined health that play a role in terms of both access to care, access to services, access to proper nutrition and food. Um, and then there's also the effects of medications, not just HIV medications, but also other medications for other disease states. Next slide, please. So this is um, data that was just uh, presented recently at the International AIDS Conference this summer from two large cohorts um, uh, in Europe and Australia, the RESPOND cohort. And they looked at the development of hypertension, which is um, high blood pressure. And they looked at people um, and they divided them based on their uh, antiretroviral therapy. So integrase inhibitors versus those who were not on integrase inhibitors. And we know integrase inhibitors are probably the most popular, mo most common antiretroviral therapy used today. And in that study or in this analysis, about 30% of people without hypertension at the beginning developed hypertension over time. And this was associated with some of the medications, including as a class, the integrase inhibitors. Um, next slide, please. But what we struggle with is really a gap in the evidence-based guidelines. So the evidence-based guidelines that many clinicians and practitioners look to are really single disease focused, meaning there are cardiovascular disease guidelines, there are diabetes management guidelines, there are management guidelines for chronic kidney disease, but there is a lack or gap of knowledge in terms of the guidelines for people with multiple comorbidities, including, and especially in this context, HIV. So for instance, this is um, just a screenshot of guidelines that were just published on the management of cardiovascular disease for the general population. Next slide, please, or if you could advance the slide. However, if you uh, have paid any attention to the, uh, to the information that came out of um, the International AIDS Conference uh, this summer, there was the announcement of the reprieve trial. Um, next slide, please. And this trial, just to summarize it really quickly, is the, what they did was they provided statin therapy to people who would be considered quote unquote low risk or who had overall low risk and would not meet the current guideline standards for starting statin therapy to reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease. And what did they find? They actually found that if individuals with HIV were started on something called pitavastatin, there was actually a 35% reduction in major, major cardiac events. And again, and these were people who were considered low to moderate risk. So we know that in terms of um, the guidelines that we need to probably modify our guidelines or adapt our, mod um, adapt our guidelines to consider HIV as a factor um, in terms of um, managing diseases and that we do not have this information. Next slide, please. Um, what about mental health and uh, psychological well-being? Well, this is just a, uh, just a quick summary of overall prevalence of um, anxiety, depression, and bipolar disorder in um, cohorts, the ROA study um, out of San Francisco. And these are people aging with HIV, and you can see the prevalence here. Um, nearly two-thirds of individuals had either anxiety or depression with about 12% with bipolar disease. Next um, slide, please. We also know that um, substance use, even in individuals who may not have had issues with substances previously, as people age, there is a, a slight increased risk of developing um, dependency on other substances. And in one analysis, there was um, a study looking at uh, alcohol prevalence in persons with HIV over 60, about 17% of people with um, HIV use, uh, having alcohol use disorder. We know that alcohol consumption can lead to other comorbidities and it can impact overall cognitive function and potentially may lead to issues with adherence to the care continuum. Next slide, please. But what are some of the other struggles and challenges? And I think this is something that does not really get talked about a lot, but I think is really important, especially as members of POTS. Uh, nearly two thirds of adults with HIV experience both HIV stigma and ageism. And this, these are both what may be considered sort of silent um, issues that people cannot visibly see. And ageism is, is huge. Um, 
and is a growing concern among uh, our population. Next slide, please. And of course, we know the impact of stigma on, on, on engagement with care and retention in care. And you know, as part of our overall national HIV AIDS strategy, we know that retention in care and engagement in care are so important, but we know that also stigma plays a huge barrier in that. And as, um, as stigma, uh, as this becomes an issue, and if we layer on ageism around that, that can impact um, not only retention in care, but also um, in terms of treatment adherence and people, um, there has been data that shows that increased stigma experience can lead to detectable viral loads. Next slide, please. So we have issues of stigma, we have issues of ageism, we have um, other, other issues that all can impact overall mental health. And so mental health issues are really rising to the top as one of the more important um, uh, conditions that I think healthcare practitioners and uh, geriatricians and primary care providers all need to take into account as we uh, deal and manage and care for our uh, uh, individuals aging with HIV. Next slide, please. What a, so we talked about stigma. What are some of the other issues that come up with adherence that may impact um, older adults? So one of the things there's this, this is a study. This is actually data from um, uh, that includes people with HIV and without HIV. But we know that as the cost of medications and pharmaceutical copays increase, um, there is a greater likelihood of what is called prescription abandonment. So people may pick and choose which medications they take based on the cost and coverage. And this is a growing concern as income becomes more and more um, important as people um, mature and uh, their income stream may change or decline. Change, uh, next slide, please. And why is this all important? We talked about mental health, we talked about physical health, but what we're really talking about and what is so important for persons as, as they age or regardless of age, I think is really what we're talking about is quality of life. And um, now more than ever, quality of life is so important. We also know that many of these uh, issues uh, can increase or uh, are attributable to increased healthcare costs as well as overall mortality. Next um, slide, please. And here is something that I think we don't think about all the time, but I think we are really on the precipice of a major crisis. And this is um, where are, where are um, individuals aging with it, HIV going to get care? And where is the expertise? We know that even in the general population for um, geriatric specialists. So geriatrics is its own specialty. So there are specific needs and skill sets and knowledge that geriatricians have that others do not, right? So in the US, it's estimated that um, in the next decade or so, there'll be a 50% increase in the demand for geriatricians um, for the general population. Currently, there's only about 8,000 practicing full-time geriatricians. And in terms of adult gerontology nurse practitioners or advanced practice nurses, a little less than 16% are um, adult gero certified. Now, just because we are certified in uh, adult gerontology doesn't necessarily mean we specifically practice in the field of ger uh, geriatrics, but it's uh, nonetheless, we do not have enough um, individuals to really work in the workforce. And when we think about knowledge gaps and we think about caring for individuals with HIV, we need to harness the expertise of our HIV providers and partner with those who are, H uh, who are aging specialists to really um, provide care that is quality care for all of, our, uh, all of the people that we take care of. Next slide, please. So here's just an example, right? So um, when we think about HIV providers, so the next couple of slides really focus on um, care that uh, HIV providers do. So as HIV providers, I can tell you, as an HIV provider myself, I can tell you that you know care has evolved, right? We, we, we initially started as infectious disease folks, um, then we moved into primary care as people started doing better. And now as people are aging, we, uh, a lot of primary care providers need to start learning some of the other sort of uh, geriatric nuanced care. But this is uh, data that was just reported or published uh, fairly recently looking at statin use. So again, statin use helps reduce cardiovascular risk. 
And this is just based on current standards now. And we know that the current standards now may underestimate the use of statins. Well, here uh, in this one clinic analysis, they looked at all the people who were eligible for statin, how many of them were actually receiving a statin. And you can see, uh, next slide please, that overall, um, about a third of individuals who would benefit from statin living with HIV were not receiving a statin. Again, these are based on the current guidelines, which are yet, which may be revised shortly. Uh, next slide, please. In people with known cardiovascular disease, 7%. Next slide, please. Um, in diabetes, which is another major um, disease that can impact vascular disease, um, a third of individuals were not receiving statins. And these were people who were cared for in an HIV practice. So this is you know, telling um, the type of care that is currently being pro uh, provided. Next slide, please. Um, very, uh, very interesting. This is just also published or is in press at the moment, um, looking at hypertension, so high blood pressure management. This is uh, through Monica Gandhi's group at San Francisco General. They looked, they have about 2,500 individuals who um, met this criteria. 69% of individuals had hypertension, but only about 39% were prescribed anti um, hypertensive therapy or medications to treat their hypertension. So, you know, even the type of knowledge that we need to do and the type of knowledge that we have to have and the resources that we have now, um, we still need to do better overall in managing these chronic conditions. Next slide, please. Something that we need to start looking forward to or thinking about proactively is really our long-term care system and um, skilled nursing care. We know that as individuals age into their 70s, 80s, or 90s, or beyond, that there's a certain percentage of individuals who will need and use and utilize the services of long-term care facilities because they have no one else to care for them or they need specialized nursing care to, to um, keep them um, uh, healthy and, and um, functional. One study, this was uh, also published last year, looked at individuals living with HIV who were in long stay nursing homes. And 64% of individuals with HIV did not receive antiretroviral therapy when they were in the long-term care facility. So here again, lies the gap in both knowledge and care and the inconsistencies that individuals can um, experience and that we need to think about and really focus on as we move forward. Next slide, please. Some other clinical challenges. Um, in 2022, um, almost 4,000 new infections were um, among those uh, 55 years and older. And we know that persons uh, who are diagnosed later in life typically have more advanced disease. Um, about a third of those um, diagnosed uh, had advanced HIV disease. So these are individuals who probably accessed care multiple times during their, uh, before 55 for other conditions, but never were tested or offered HIV testing. And so a third of them went on until they had more advanced disease to be diagnosed. And that's something that we really need to focus on and reinforce, even though we are doing a better job at offering and screening, we still need to do better. Um, this is actually on a positive note in terms of um, PrEP to need ratio. So pre-exposure uh, prophylaxis. There has been an increase over the last several years uh, with the most recent data showing about 36.7% uh, of persons 55 years of old who have indications for PrEP or who um, need PrEP actually received it. But we still have multiple opportunities for screening and early detection that are often missed. And, um, you know, again, I think from a policy standpoint and from a healthcare system standpoint, we still need to um, get that message out and reinforce the importance of um, the tools that we have available to us now. Next slide, please. So just key takeaways, I know I um, have just a few minutes left here. Um, persons aging with HIV experience higher rates of co-occurring conditions that appear at earlier ages. There are multiple factors that impact aging, both social, biological, physical, cultural, and economic. 
we need more research and we need more evidence to understand the impact of aging in persons uh, with HIV, those who acquired HIV in adulthood, but also those who may have acquired it perinatally. And we must educate and continue to train the healthcare workforce to care for persons aging with HIV in order to help improve the quality of life for all individuals with HIV. Next slide. Thank you. This is my contact information and hopefully I provided just a nice introduction or foundation for the rest of the panel. Dr. Kwong, thank you so much. That was truly magnificent. You gave us a great overview and a great grounding. I know that you're going to be able to stay with us through the end of this segment and we'll have some Q&A at the end, but, there, but we want to take at least one question that came from the chat earlier. So Dr. Leo Moore, would you frame your question for Dr. Kwong and then we'll move to the next segment in this, in the, um, in this uh, panel. Leo? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Um, so my question, Dr. Kwong, was regarding um, the patavastatin study that you uh, shared. Um, I was curious if there have been any whole food plant-based diet and exercise studies regarding preventing future major cardiac risks in people living with HIV. I was happy to hear about the work with patavastatin, but also concerned about potential polypharmacy, you know, as patients age. And so just wondering if there are any of those types of studies that are also being done. Personally, I'm having trouble hearing you, Dr. Kwong. Not Thank you. Muted. Well. My apologies. Thank you so much. That's a great question. Um, you know, I know there has been uh, a large push towards the benefits of plant-based diet, physical activity, et cetera. Um, I don't know, out of full disclosure, if there is a current ongoing study, but um, I can definitely look into that and get back to you. But um, that is something that I think is an important aspect um, as well. Thank you. And Jeff, before we leave, we have one question from uh, Pacha member Lockett uh, asking if any of the studies you present today included people who were transgender. That is a good question. Um, I think to my knowledge of all the ones that I've presented, there were um, not uh, a, a population of individuals who identified as transgender, but that is also a large gap that we need to fill as well. Great. Thank you, Dr. Kwong, and we're glad that you're going to be able to stay with us to the end of this segment. We're going to now transition to hearing from the community, and we'll invite uh, Alicia Diggs to, uh, to uh, set the stage and to introduce the panel for that segment. Alicia? Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Kwan, for the information that you shared. Um, we look forward to delving deeper into that particular topic. And coming up next, we definitely want to hear from the community's perspective as it pertains to HIV and aging, um, and not just the um, from the aspect of those who are 50 and older, but those who have lived with HIV the majority of their lives. So I would like to first start with introducing Antoinette Jones, who is the co-executive director of Dandelions Incorporated. Um, Antoinette began her work in advocacy in her early 20s as a peer specialist, facilitating access to preventive care and treatment for people living with and at risk for HIV. She identifies as a dandelion women living with HIV, meaning she has been living with HIV since birth. Ms. Jones is the co-executive director and co-founder of the Dandelions Movement, which centers the needs of people born with HIV through mentorship, healing, and peer-to-peer -peer interventions. Ms. Jones specializes in reproductive health care, holistic wellness, human rights, and dignity for Black and Indigenous women. She works in partnership with organizations and providers to improve treatments and services for Black women. She also has contributed to the advancements of the federal guidelines around breast and chest feeding for women living with HIV. Ms. Jones also uses her activist mind, voice, and power to bridge unique intersections amongst the creators of Our Time and Black Health. And then we'll have Jeff Berry, who is the Executive Director of the Reunion Project. 
also the co-founder of the Reunion Project, the National Alliance of HIV Long-Term Survivors, and serves as the chair of the Reunion Project's National Steering Committee. Mr. Berry, who was diagnosed with HIV in 1989, currently serves on various boards of organizations and was recently appointed to the Illinois Commission of LGBT Aging and serves as co-chair of the HIV and Aging Long-Term Survivor Committee. Mr. Berry was also featured, was a featured actor in part one of the Emmy nominated HIV and the Journey Towards Zero, a docu-series released in February, 2023, which was produced by the Chicago Department of Public Health and Tessa Films. Mr. Berry has contributed to a number of publications and websites and has received various awards. He also resides in Chicago, Illinois with his husband, Stephen, and his two furry friends, or should I say two furry kids? I'm a fur mom myself. So I'd like to welcome Antoinette Jones and Jeff Berry to our panelist discussion. And I'll turn it back over to you, Jesse. Thank you, Alicia. And Alicia, you're going to be part of this panel discussion as well. So I'm going to ask all three of you, Antoinette, Jeff, and Alicia, you heard some amazing information, some of it alarming from Dr. Kwong with regard to the medical issues we're facing. What is your lived experience uh, and for, the, for yourself and the people you represent with regard to the medical and comorbidities that people living uh, long-term with HIV or lifetime survivors with HIV have? Let's start with you. Jeff, why don't we start with you and then we'll go to Antoinette. Uh, thank you. And thank you to um, Jesse and Alicia for, um, you know, sharing this you know, subcommittee. I want to really thank Pacha um, and uh, for this opportunity to speak and for highlighting the, the needs of long-term survivors and people aging with HIV. Um, and I just hope that this is, you know, the first of many conversations going forward. So, um, you know, when we talk about long-term survivors, um, you know, from the beginning, the Union Project has always, you know, in, in included what we know uh, are, are lifetime survivors. And so, um, you know, the, one of the definitions is also people who are diagnosed pre-1996 to before there was heart. And so um, we also recognize people living with HIV 10 years or more are long-term survivors and, and also allies, people who who may not be living with HIV, but have um, you know, experienced a lot of the same loss and, and trauma um, and were there in the early days of the epidemic. And so if you go by that pre-heart or pre-1996 definition, um, it's estimated there's around 300,000 long-term survivors in, in the United States. And globally, um, I think it's even, you know, obviously it's larger than that and it's going to continue to grow. So I think when we talk about uh, survival and thriving, whatever you want to call it, we need to really um, uh, incorporate that and keep in mind the global implications and, and, and uh, you know, issues that, because, you know, we can't do this in silos. We can't, you know, we've learned very early in our work and continually can learn that, you know, a piecemeal approach and, you know, working in silos just doesn't work. And so, um, I'm really inspired that there are a lot of advocates that are coming up along the way, but I feel like we really need um, something more formal, something more structured to get people interested in, in advocacy around long-term survival, around aging with HIV. Uh, many of us are nearing our expiration date, if you will. Um, and so it's going to be really critical to, um, you know, make sure that there are people who are interested, involved, and are going to be carrying the torch going forward um, as uh, you know advocates for HIV and aging, and, and and how do we do that? And treat uh, research literacy, you know. So you know, being part of these uh, uh, advisory boards that are impacting research around cure, around treatment, around prevention for older adults and people living with HIV long term. I think you're muted, Jesse. Yes, and Antoinette, you bring a unique perspective that hasn't been elevated as often as it should be of people born with HIV. What did you hear from the data and the statistics and the information that Dr. Kwan gave to us 
And does it resonate with your life, your lived experience as a lifetime survivor? And then, Elisa, I want to hear from you as a woman living with HIV. Did that data really and those issues resonate with you and your lived experience? Antoinette, to you. Yes, thank you. Um, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Thank you for having me. Um, and uh, some of it resonated with me. And let me introduce myself. I'm Antoinette, she, her pronouns, and I'm the executive director of Dandelions, Inc. And I'm also a national field organizer at Positive Women's Network. Um, and like, just to answer the question, uh, some of it resonated with me, especially around the modification of the guidelines that Dr. Kwong mentioned. Um, that's definitely an issue in our community because uh, most of the aging um, guidelines or anything related to Asian does look at uh, a certain age group, uh, majority of the time over 40 or 50. And a lot of the comorbidities that dandelions or lifetime survivors encounter um, there isn't really any screenings or any research around uh, the impact of these uh, comorbidities, whether life or death. Um, one of the guidelines that I think about when I, when Dr. Kwong mentioned the modification was the uh, screening for breast cancer. Um, and I know that um, these guidelines, like I said, don't take into account our specific aging population. So those under 40. Um, and then one of the, the third most common cause of death of uh, people aged 25 to 35 is um, cancerous tumors. And that's actually the cause of death of someone who was very close to me um, who transitioned this year from breast cancer and she was a dandelion. There's a lack of uh, research, there's a lack of inclusion. Um, and if the guidelines are set in, in, in place to um, only screen for folks who are 40 and over, then that automatically creates a gap and limits um, early treatment and, um, and saving of lives of people who were born with HIV. So that's something that definitely resonated with me. Um, and I'm for sure like just um, something that we advocate in the Dandelions Lifetime Survivor Community. Thank you. Thank you, Antoinette. And Alicia, as a member of Pacha and as of this particular segment of the panel, are Black women included? Did you hear that Black women's issues are really being addressed from a clinical perspective? Black women living with HIV? Thank you. I hear a little of it, but it's not enough. And the end, this work is just not enough. Um, and we need to do more. And I'm looking forward to us doing more. And, you know, it was mentioned from Dr. Kwan's presentation about the women interagency HIV study WISE. And that's something that I've been a part of for quite some time, too many years to even remember. And the purpose of me participating was to make sure that people who look like me were in those studies so that we understand how medications work specifically for us and how this research needs to make sure that it is very, very inclusive. And as a person aging, um, and it's now been almost 23 years for me, and then also being a person that's over 50, to be honest with you, before these conversations, I did not place myself within this category at all. And when I dealt with or started to deal with certain comorbidities on my own, I attributed, attributed it to weight and other things that I went through outside of HIV. But as I got connected to those aging with, thriving with lifetime and long-term survivors, then I was able to truly understand and see myself um, within this particular community and know that the work that we're doing, we have to continue to press in that work. We have to continue to make sure our voices are heard. As I personally participate in research studies, I make sure that I gather the information and education I need to share with my peers so that they can see themselves in presentations like Dr. Share. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alicia. Let's move outside the clinical setting to our everyday lives. I can remember I put in the chat earlier that my late partner died 38 years ago, and shortly after he died, my insurance agent came to my apartment and sold me disability insurance, and I'm still regretting that he didn't sell me long-term care insurance. So what are the social and financial issues that 
people, longtime survivors, people aging with HIV are facing, what was not said in the clinical setting that PACHA members need to need to hear and understand? And what can we do about them? Uh, let's start again with you, Jeff, and then we'll go to Antoinette and Alicia. Yeah, thanks. Um, wow, such a that's such a huge issue. So I, I recently did like an informal Facebook poll, uh, you know, and asked folks what's the most important issues facing long-term survivors and financial survival was like came up again and again. Um, you know, somebody mentioned medications, um, how expensive HIV meds are under part, Medicare Part D. Um, people talked about housing, they talked about transportation, community support, um, access to care, including compassionate and culturally competent care. We saw the slide that Dr. Kong, you know, on long-term care facilities, which is, um, we've heard horrific stories of people um, having to spend down all of their assets uh, to, or get divorced even, um, you know, to just to qualify for benefits. I mean, that's not, Right, right. I mean, it's um, it's it's uh, it's devastating, um, and it's you know something that we really need to address and think about now, um, while we have the opportunity to to, to make some changes. Because, um, yeah, I wish I had a long term care policy too, but you know they don't sell them like they used to. They're very and they're much more expensive than they used to be. So, um, even the people who have those policies. Um, you know, it, it's it's not enough uh, with the spiraling cost of healthcare. And then you're talking about going to a, a long-term care facility that's not LGBTQ sensitive or competent, um, not uh, you know, uh, you know, not, not not competent care at all in any aspect. Um, so people having to go back in the closet um, and it's for fear of being ostracized or treated differently in a long-term care facility. So this is what we have to look forward to unless we start to make changes now. Unfortunately. Yeah, thank you. Antoinette, lived experience outside of the clinical setting. We heard a lot about stigma and ageism, but is that is stigma something that long-term survivors, long-time, lifetime survivors experience? Tell us. Of course. And Jeff mentioned a few of the other uh, issues that we have to deal with as lifetime survivors. But stigma is definitely a major one. And that's something that the Dandelion Alliance movement actually uh, works to combat internalized and externalized stigma. We have had to age with this virus since um, birth, since grade school, um, middle school, high school, and going through all of those um, very unique experiences where you just want to fit in and you want to be normal like the rest of the folks in your classroom um is not something or is something that we had to deal with and had to actually grow up with uh isolation is another thing we have been told um or recommended that we shouldn't share our hiv status with anybody so immediately um uh, upon even trying to make decisions for ourselves, we, we've been stripped um, of our rights, of our, um, of our livelihood, and, and just kept in secret. Um, and that has become like the societal norm for the Alliance Lifetime Survivors, hence why we are now living in, I guess, a day and age where, you know, talking about this community, my community has become more normalized in the past few months. Um, it's not that we haven't been here or we haven't been in many spaces like Pacha and uh, sitting on many advisory councils. It's just that there hasn't been enough of us and hasn't been a movement or a sounding body to make enough noise to really help the rest of the HIV community see that we are here. Um, so isolation, stigma, violence, uh, whether it's self-violence, um, external violence, discrimination, uh, so something that we are definitely demanding is just to see at the table, inclusion, recognition, um, value, um, respect, because we are aging. One thing that I also learned was that the first um, person to be diagnosed born, born with HIV was in 1977. And I think on the last panel, it was mentioned around, um, or actually Alicia just mentioned it, of like we, we've been here uh, since the beginning of the epidemic, even before. Um, so it's important to really like recognize um, where this community is at and how do we move us along and um, really include us ongoingly um, with that out be complete. 
Thank you. Could I just add something to that, um, Jesse, if, if it's okay? Um, what uh, Antoinette was saying about, um, you know, providers, uh, particularly, and um, the stigma that's, you know, it made me think of uh, one of the um, a person who attended one of our uh, greening projects in Chicago a few years ago, uh, African-American woman in her 70s. She was diagnosed late. I mean, she was diagnosed in her 50s, but she was definitely had been living with HIV for 25 years. She lived in the South. She used to go on the bus and talk to kids about, you know, HIV and are they protecting themselves? And when she got to Chicago, she lived in a food desert on the South side in this high rise, was afraid to leave her house. Um, and she went to the provider and the nurse, you know, she started telling, uh, telling her about this and being open about her HIV status. And the nurse said to her, oh, we don't talk about that stuff here. You know, so the stigma is real. It's deadly. It's, um, we had a gentleman stand up in, in Birmingham, Alabama uh, earlier this year, uh, disclosed that he, a black gay man, disclosed he was uh, HIV positive first time publicly in 38 years that he had ever disclosed. I mean, that's the kind of stigma is just so ingrained and it's so powerful. And it's just like Dr. Kwan said, it leads to poor health outcome, poor you know, medical adherence and uh, mental health, you know, everything. So it's just really tied to everything. And so it's a huge issue. I also want to, because you just uh, sparked something in my mind, like uh, recognize that a lot of the lifetime survivors are millennials, uh, Gen Z, older millennials. Um, and I saw this post on social media that was like, millennials have had to gone through so much, a few mass shootings, 9-11, two world wars, uh, great recessions, uh, a pandemic, two pandemics. Um, like we have just lived through so much in the history book, yet alone being in inflation at the moment, just trying to survive. Um, so if you think about all of those things, and then in addition, uh, HIV diagnosis, a lifelong HIV diagnosis, it just increases all of those things of stigma. Um, my community specifically, with all of these social determinants up against us, um, and we know that in this in the epidemic campaign, we just want adherence, they want like Benita said, pill pushers, they want people to just take their medications, but it's really hard to get to that or think about that. When folks are struggling with food security, with housing issues, especially my generation, with job security, with equitable rate, wages, um, child care is through the roof. You see, like my child is running around here, access to insurance. We can't even get life insurance in my community. <laughs> like. Um, yet alone any community in the HIV world. So it's it's challenging um, just in this day and age that we are living in. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. As we come to the close of this part of our panel discussion for today, I want to invite a Pacha member. If any one Pacha member has a question that they'd like to ask of this really inspiring panel, uh, this would be the time. And then we will have time for our all the panelists to engage in Q&A with the uh, Pacha members at the end of the next segment. But before we do, is any Pacha member have anything pressing that they'd like to ask this inspiring panel? Before we do that, please, I just, I was really getting excited when um, both Jeff and Antoinette was speaking and just wanted to include when we talk about isolation, me coming from a generation of what goes on in the house stays in the house and then to add HIV to it and also being a person coming from the city, but then moving to the South and really experiencing people who were in um, who are isolated in rural areas. They're not able to get to the doctors. Now they're not, they're not able to get um, participate in conversations like we're having right now due to maybe lack of internet access, et cetera. So I just really wanted to bring that into the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Well, if you don't mind me stealing your question, Paul Kawada, I'm going to ask this final question of this group. If you had the opportunity to sit down with Secretary Becerra, what would you like to say to him that needs to be done for your for the lived experience that you believe he can help you um, achieve the thriving that you want to have, what would you say to Secretary or ask of Secretary Becerra? Alicia? 
I would simply like to just have acknowledged that we are here and we want to participate and we want to have our voices heard and to listen to us, not to continue to make decisions without us and then ask for our input after decisions have been made. Um, as our dandelions indicate, we are here, we have always been here. Antoinette? Yes, I would definitely agree with Alicia. We are here. Uh, Vanita mentioned in, uh, in the last panel, like just include us, our, ask for our opinions, make our uh, elevate our voices, um, and give us a seat at the table. There are so many other things. Um, one of our dandelions has been really pushing the Hope Act, um, pushing for un, um, more research around the transplant transplant list, and. Um, just many things I can go on and on. I can go on and on, but at least let's start with a conversation. Excellent. And Jeff, what would you say to Secretary Becerra? How much time do I have now? Um, so I, I would echo what Antoinette just said, you know, regarding the HOPE transplant study and just, you know, what's keeping us from making uh, HIV to HIV transplant standard of care for, I think, an estimated 10,000 people living with HIV on dialysis uh, who need life-preserving uh, transplant. I'd also, you know, I, I made a public comment, I think earlier this year, um, just to reiterate again, I think we need an HIV and aging czar, Phil, uh, um, you know, uh, Harold, you know, Phillips, uh, you, I've had this conversation with you um, and you, you know, you need help. He needs help. Um, he, it's a one man show right now. And I think we need a coordinated effort Cross collaborative effort across all the federal agencies that is spearheaded, you know, by a person who's, you know, leading that effort. Um, uh, because, you know, I don't, you know, I don't think it's prioritized right now. And I think, you know, as we saw on that slide, where seventy percent of people living with HIV will be over the age of fifty in a few years. Um, yeah, it's it's time. Great. Well, thank you, Alicia. Thank you for bringing this panel together. Antoinette and Jeff, thank you. We hope that you're going to be able to stay for the end of this segment when we'll have a broader Q&A. But the last question was actually a segue to the final segment of this session for Pacha, and that is, what is the policy agenda for people aging with HIV and for long-term survivors? And there's no one better to do that than Ronald Johnson. I uh, when Ronald Johnson retired from Age United, I said he was a legend at that time, and he's continued to be a legend by his work now with the U.S. People Living with HIV Caucus, with his work on the HIV and Aging Policy Action Coalition at Age United, and of course his long-term many, many years of service, starting with his work as the Special Advisor on HIV AIDS to Mayor Dinkins in New York, all the way through all the work that he did as the Vice President for Policy and Advocacy at Age United. So. So, Ronald, tell us what is the policy agenda that we need to be promoting as PACHA members at federal levels and even at the state level? Tell us what we need to know. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Jesse, and thank you, Alicia. And I uh, also want to start by certainly thanking uh, Jeff Berry, Antoinette, and, and Dr. Kwan for their presentations uh, that have been very informing and inspiring uh, on this panel. And also to really thank Pacha for forming this subcommittee, uh, which I think heightens the awareness and focus on uh, HIV and aging and those of us who are aging with HIV, myself, an older adult, uh, living with HIV, so really want to express appreciation for not only this panel, but for the subcommittees, I hope, continued focus on this area and the people uh, that are uh, included uh, and affected by HIV and aging. Next slide. <clears throat> We've had presentations that have already set the context, but just want to uh, repeat uh, and highlight uh, in 2021, persons 50 years and older, uh, we accounted for 53% of all people living with HIV. And the, in terms of 
new diagnoses, uh, people 50 years and older accounted for uh, just a little over 16% of all HIV AIDS diagnoses. And the projection that we have all heard, and we know that by 2030, up to 70% of people living with HIV will be 50 years and older. <clears throat> Next slide. And also uh, to acknowledge the population of long-term survivors who are under 50 years of age and the population of life uh, lifetime uh, survivors. And Antoinette's presentation certainly highlighted uh, that population and the, the importance of uh, recognizing and lifting up uh, the concerns and needs of lifetime survivors. Next, but, next uh, slide. And I'll also just really stress that when we look at HIV and aging, uh, and it needs to be in the context of the overall aging of the U.S. population. Uh, population of people 50 years and older is increasing and is expected to increase beyond 2030. Uh, people age 65 and older uh, specifically constitutes about 17% 70, of the population in 2020. And that is expected to grow to 22% of the 20 by 2040. So when we look at HIV and aging, I think it's important to put it into the context of the overall aging of the US population and the worldwide population. Next slide. So I think we, we can, and listening to the presentations that we had earlier, uh, to look at a policy goal uh, and of enabling people living with HIV who are 50 years and older, long-term HIV survivors, and lifetime survivors, enabling us to maintain good physical, mental, and sexual health, and to maintain good quality of life. Next slide. And we've seen an increased focus, and I've mentioned this many times, I'm really personally uh, astounded at the, the large and increased focus on HIV and aging over the past four years. And we currently know, and I think this is very important as we look at the policy in issues and implications, we currently know a great deal about HIV and aging. Dr. Kwan shares some of the clinical knowledge and issues that, that we have. Uh, and hearing from Jeff Berry and Antoinette Jones about the needs of, of, of those of us who are aging with, with HIV. We have a, a solid knowledge base. We need to know more and, and more, but we have a solid base. And, a base that's been reflected in policy papers and, and briefs, uh, listening sessions with people aging with HIV and how important those listening sessions are in order to inform the policy issues and, and the policy actions that we had. We had listening sessions uh, earlier this year at AIDS Watch and USCHA and our planning another listening session for, for AIDS Watch uh, and beyond. So these are very important because they enable us to hear directly the concerns that, that people have. And increased advocacy for HIV and aging. Uh, Jesse, in his introduction, mentioned the HIV AIDS Policy Action uh, Coalition, the Rock for Aging uh, Policy Group, the HIV 50 Plus Network. Uh, that is just the FAP Working Group. I'm just touching the surface of the, the increased focus of advocacy. And we have a core network of HIV and aging advocates uh, that can push the policy agenda. So I think we have a good base from which we can launch the kind of policy focus and the policy actions that we ha have to 
focus on moving forward. Next slide. And with this focus that we have on HIV and aging and the, the large, <clears throat> and I think, and I hope growing number of advocates and policy analysts focusing on that, I think there is what I consider a great deal of consensus on some of the challenges faced by people aging with HIV and the policy issues that emerge from those uh, those, those challenges, the difficulties in accessing and managing comprehensive and integrated health care. And when I say comprehensive and integrated, dealing with the kinds of clinical issues that Dr. Kwan uh, showed us in his presentation, particularly around comorbidities and the multiple comorbidities that people aging with HIV are confronted with, uh, and the importance of integrating geriatric care and HIV care. HIV specialists need to know more about geriatric care. Uh, geriatricians need to know about HIV, and that's the kind of comprehensive care that is needed. The transition to Medicare and integrating Medicare with private health insurance and Ryan White programs is increasingly becoming an issue as more and more people age to, uh, to 65 and enter the Medicare system uh, because of age and not be, uh, due to a disability and the two-year waiting period uh, for under the disability uh, criteria for enrolling in Medicare. Mental health programs and substance and, and alcohol use uh, treatment issues. This, the need for that, the fact that we don't often have programs that are specifically geared for older adults uh, living with HIV, uh, programs that are specifically geared to lifetime survivors. Uh, these are a very important need for housing, food, nutrition, the whole gamut of socioeconomic support services. Uh, Jeff Berry mentioned the financial, financial issues and the need for financial survival. We need policies, we need programs that can address those. We're still dealing with the impact of COVID-19 and, and MPOX. Uh, and the need for long-term care. I'm gonna stress that and come back to that in a moment. And the need for programs that address loneliness and social isolation. Again, I'm gonna come back to that. Uh, need to dismantle stigma and discrimination, including ageism uh, and the need to strengthen the workforce. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Kwan in his presentation noted the gaps between uh, the, the workforce availability and the demand. Uh, and a recent study has shown that new uh, physicians coming uh, out of medical school are not choosing uh, geriatric as a specialty. So there, there are already workforce issues and these issues are going to uh, multiply as we go forward. Again, I want to turn to, to the issue of long-term care, and this is really an, a very important need, and the and again, the policy implications that stem from that, uh, both in terms of the quality of long-term care, uh, the, the degree to which medications are available in long-term uh, care facilities or are not available, uh, as has already been pointed out, and also long-term care that would enable people to stay in their home. Uh, many of us uh, uh, who fear, and we he hear this in some of the listening sessions, the, the real concern about having to go to into a facility, a nursing home, or other kind of facility. So enabling long-term care to be in-house and in your home and for you to stay in home is very, very critical. Uh, loneliness 
and social isolation. Just recently, the World Health Organization identified loneliness as a serious public health threat. On, WHO has established a social commission dealing with loneliness and the important and social isolation and the need for social connectedness. Uh, it's very, very prevalent. I think it doesn't always get the kind of attention uh, that the prevalence of loneliness and social isolation among people, particularly older adults living with HIV. So I did really want to stress when we look at the challenges and the policy issues that stem from those challenges, the importance of uh, loneliness and addressing loneliness and building social connections. Next slide. And also, Many of the medical problems now faced by people living with HIV, uh, including and perhaps especially, well, in my case especially, older adults living with HIV, uh, have more to do with aging than with an HIV-related illness directly. Dealing with cardiovascular diseases, dealing with kidney disease, dealing with frailty and the fear and the vulnerability that many people have to falling uh, is very much uh, an, an issue. And a recent study that was reported at this year's CROI noted that more people are, are HIV positive individuals are dying of non HIV related causes of death. So that is a part of the policy, the challenges that have very real policy implications. Next slide. I want to note the federal response to, to these issues and the, the policy programs that at the federal level, certainly with the National HIV AIDS Strategy that was released, uh, I think, uh, two years ago, uh, or this World AIDS Day, uh, and its inclusion of Objective 2.5, which calls for expanding the capacity to provide whole person care to older adults with HIV and long-term survivors. And I, I think uh, this was the first time that a national HIV AIDS strategy had a objective specific to a population, in this case, older adults uh, with HIV and long-term survivors. Next slide. And as Harold Phillips pointed out in his presentation uh, this morning, just on World AIDS Day last Friday, <coughs> the administration uh, released uh, an interim action report. Uh, and as again, as uh, Harold Phillips pointed out, some of the key actions that have been taken uh, to advance the national HIV AIDS strategy, which includes a strategy uh, for responding to older adults and long-term survivors. Next slide. The Ryan White program, I don't think I have to go much on that, but just to highlight as that is a key element in the federal response and the, the policy issues are related around the HIV AIDS program of, of supporting that program and supporting its ability to address older adults uh, who are clients of Ryan White programs. Next slide. Also very important when we talk about HIV and aging and when we talk about older adults living with HIV uh, to increase our focus on the Older Americans Act. Uh, and a key feature of the Older Americans Act is the, uh, the recognition and designation of populations of greatest social need uh, with a particular attention to low-income individuals, minority individuals. Uh, and so looking at what opportunities are there under the Older Americans Act uh, that can help serve uh, older adults and what are the policy issues and the, the, the focus, that importance that we as policy advocates include the Older Americans Act in our purview. Next slide. And th that 
response, that policy response uh, includes uh, uh, about two years ago, the Administration for Community Living, which has the responsibility for administering the Older Americans Act, had issued a new state plan guidance. And in that guidance, it encouraged states to take a broad approach to ensuring services are reaching older adults. And it included uh, requiring states to include in their state plans how they are serving older adults living with HIV. And I think that requirement uh, in that guidance uh, began in October of 22. So states that have plans going forward have to include how they are addressing older adults. And we as policy analysts and advocates need to monitor what the states are, are doing in response to uh, how their services for older adults. Next slide. And again, uh, the and Harold, Howell Phillips mentioned this in his presentation, uh, the proposed rule that would strengthen that and to say that state plans must include people living with HIV in their definition of a population of greatest social and economic need. A really important advancement on the policy front uh, made under the Biden-Harris uh, administration of including uh, and making sure that state plans include how a description of how greatest social and economic need is being addressed and including older adults in, in that description of how greater social and economic need is being addressed. Next slide. This circles back to the challenges that people aging with HIV are facing. And not to repeat that, but to again highlight and to show the array of challenges. And as I said earlier, the remarkable, and that's my word, remarkable level of consensus on these issues uh, <clears throat> that are faced by people aging with HIV. Next slide. And <clears throat> but policy issues require policy action. And certainly as I'm an, an advocate, I uh, really would stress we need action. And again, going back to that goal to enable people living with HIV who are 50 years and older, long-term survivors, lifelong survivors, uh, being able to maintain good physical, mental, and sexual health and our quality of life. Next slide. So I want to make some suggestions to the subcommittee uh, on how the subcommittee uh, can work with the administration and engage meaningfully, meaningfully with the HIV community. And engagement with the community was stressed. Benita Ray stressed this uh, earlier in, in the Pacha meeting. And on this panel, the engagement of community is essential. So working with the administration and the, and the community, I recommend that the, the subcommittee look at some, some policy actions, uh, fostering and supporting the development of models of comprehensive integrated health care. The clinical issues that, that Dr. Kwan mentioned, the, the issues and concerns that Antoinette and Jeff pointed out, we, and the feeling that among so many of us who are older adults, that, that we're not getting the quality of care that we need, uh, we're not getting all of the screenings. Uh, I could go on and on, but I won't. Uh, but we need comprehensive, integrated health care, and I hope the committee, subcommittee can help foster that. Also, broaden the support for social services for people aging with HIV and the emphasis on social connections, uh, dealing with the, the threat uh, and the reality of isolation and loneliness. We need programs. We need to uh, look at increasing the social services. Uh, we need to look at what are the policy and statutory limits 
on uh, social services and the availability of federal funding for social services. So we need that kind of focus that I hope the subcommittee can bring. Fostering and supporting the development of models of long-term care, including models for home-based uh, long-term care and models that can increase the quality of care, the, the issue uh, of the low level of availability of antiretroviral uh, medications in uh, long-term care facilities, that is unacceptable. And we need models that can assure that the quality of care in long-term facilities, the quality of care that you can have at home is realized. Looking at, again, the Older Americans Act, uh, which is coming up for reauthorization, I invite the subcommittee to work with the administration and the community to develop proposals for reauthorizing the Older Americans Act that would include language that would put into statutory language uh, addressing the needs of older adults as a population of greatest social need. It's terrific that the administration has a proposed rule on that, but we need that to be codified in the statute. And I'm hoping that that can be part of the proposals for reauthorizing the Older Americans Act. And developing programs and policies that address the unique concerns of lifetime HIV survivors. Much of the policy issues that I talked about are for older adults uh, uh, and long-term survivors, uh, but as Antoinette uh, mentioned uh, and others, long-term survivors include many, many people who are under the age of 50. There are lifetime survivors. There are unique issues and a focus on the unique issues of lifetime HIV survivors is something that, again, I hope this subcommittee can address in its work. Next slide. And, and I hope and look forward to the subcommittee reporting back on its progress and looking, jumping ahead to December 2024 when we hear the progress that has been made, when we hear about the policy actions that have been taken in response to the policy issues that we've lifted up in this session today. And I think the overall issue is, is that the healthcare system is not, in my opinion, uh, ready and to deal with all of the challenges, not only of the overall aging population in the country, but the specific aging issues of people living with HIV. We need to make that system. We need to make the healthcare systems, the social network systems, they need to work for us. They're not working for too many of us. And that has to change. That's the kind of policy action of change that we need. Next slide. And Next. with that, I open it up for questions and turn it back to uh, Alicia and, and Jesse for to guide us through some questions. Ronald, thank you so much. That was comprehensive. That was detailed. That was necessary. We've, re we've reserved some final moments, these last uh, 10 minutes or so for uh, feedback and questions and comments from all PACHA members. And I know Jeff Taylor had some questions that he wanted to ask. So Alicia, why don't we start with Jeff and then I'll bounce it to you to facilitate the final Q&A. Great, Jeff. thank you. Yeah. So uh, Vanita had mentioned early on in the meeting about the HOPE Act, and uh, which authorizes HIV, among other things, authorizes HIV to HIV organ transplants, which is going to be a growing issue as we all grow, grow older with our kidneys and livers um, damaged by the, uh, the disease, both the disease and the uh, many toxic treatments we've been on over the decades. So maybe Kay can explain for us um, kind of the scope of the HOPE Act that's now sitting on um, Secretary Becerra's desk and what Pasha can do to help uh, spur him to sign that into law. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. And Marvell? Yes, uh, my question is for uh, Dr. Uh, Kwong, but I, I wanted to first uh, thank Dr. Uh, 
uh, Ronald Johnson for his presentation. Uh, and and a, as a younger person live with HIV, I appreciate your mentorship. And I really think you need to do a masterclass because your presentation was brilliant. And so I want to say thank you so much for that. But my question uh, for Dr. Kwong is really around, uh, as we see the legal, legalization of, of cannabis in multiple states and my peers and I are engaging in this practice, uh, and we're living with HIV, whether it's recreational or medicinal, have we seen any research or studies around uh, the impact of cannabis and HIV? That's a great question. And actually, yes, there are um, several studies looking at um, cannabis use um, in persons with HIV. Um, you know, several have been published in terms of either um, the potential uh, impact on things like cognitive function or other um, health um, outcomes. Although I think you are, you, you point to something that's very um, relevant and timely, which is as more, as more states become uh, or, or remove the, the access barriers to cannabis, that we'll probably um, see more information um, as we move forward. But yes, there are currently some studies available. Thank you, Dr. Kwan, and thank you, Marvell. Any other questions from our Pacha members, from anyone else in this space? It's Rania Copeland. Thank you. This was a great panel. Um, Jesse, Alicia, y'all are uh, showing out um, uh, as the inaugural co-chairs of this really important committee, subcommittee and work. Um, and thank you to all the panelists and the presenters. Um, you guys were able to really cover a great deal of information um, from various angles and ways we have to do the work. Um, uh, and so uh, it was really useful. I think you know, we're kind of on this new frontier, it feels like, um, when it comes to aging um, uh, lifetime survivors with HIV. And, you know, you heard, we heard about some of the research, some of the science, and it seems like there's, there's new scientific innovations that are needed. Um, and uh, this is a plug also for how we think about how we make sure that we're having conversations and building advocacy skills and understanding around the science um, as medications are needed, as we're, you know, as people are aging, that there's this scientific knowledge that's also needed for people, particularly communities of color, to help build that trust around why we're taking medications daily or whatever it might be. And then uh, we also heard, Alicia, a bit on your panel um, from people uh, around, you know, the experience of being in research and contributing to research as people who have been living with HIV for long periods of time. And this need to really kind of expand the type of research that's happening to really understand, for example, from, from the Dandelion's perspective and experience, um, uh, this kind of increase that we see in cancer um, amongst people who are living with HIV, all these areas. And I wonder if there's any suggestions or recommendations for how we might want to um, uh, urge or recommend research in this area, um, who should be participating, uh, what are the types of protocols that are really supportive of making sure that people who are living with HIV and have been for long periods of time are supported through that? How do we need to think about, you know, who's doing that research? And, you know, I'm interested if anybody who spoke, you know, we had a couple people who talked about this, would have recommendations for what Pacha should be considering um, when it comes to recommendations we might make to the secretary around research that's needed in this area and how it can be done in a way that centers communities that are most impacted, make sure that we're, you know, utilizing researchers that are from community. There's kind of vast areas that we can think about recommendations, but we'd love to hear from some of the experts um, that we heard today. Thank you, Rania. And if anyone from the panel would like to maybe comment on what Rania just discussed. I can comment. Um, I love what Rania uplifted. Um, just recently, I was on the Center for AIDS Research uh, panel around a similar topic. And um, I had to like call out folks, uh, two doctors, researchers, because they um, made sure to put a disclaimer of like, oh, but we did not 
do any research on lifetime survivors. Um, and the person who went before that was Dr. Agle, who's a pediatrician and a researcher and, and does amazing work around dandelions and lifetime survivors living with HIV and made sure to include some of her research findings. But the two that came after her was like, just a disclaimer, we didn't do any research on lifetime survivors. And I just kept questioning, like, why is that? <laughs> like, why are, it seems like you are intentionally not trying to do this research when we have demanded this research for many, many years. Um, I strongly believe that when research is done on lifetime survivors, um, then the, what's needed for the rest of the aging population will come up because we have been one living with it since birth. So you will have the findings of the effects of not only the HIV medications, but also the diagnosis in itself. Um, so do the research on that specific population and then you in turn will have the answers for the rest of the aging community. That's just my belief. <laughs> um, and just holding folks accountable, I, I would say. So just me in that space holding folks accountable because what we hear is just take the medication, you will live long, healthy lives, but we see an increase in the folks who are over between the ages of 30 to 40 born with HIV or lifetime survivors who are losing their lives. Uh, we've lost many over the years. Uh, and just recently, a good friend of mine was having random seizures. Um, so we have so many unanswered questions in our community because of the lack of research. And it's like, is it intentional? Is uh, And I have to ask that, is it intentional? Why, are, why is this our specific community being left out? Why aren't we being asked to be in, included in research? Um, and just recognizing that when we were babies, when we did not have consent over our lives back in the 80s and the early 90s, we were test babies. So a lot of <laughs> we were researched on, um, but more in the, mind, in the mindset of like, uh, let's use these babies uh, with this medication to see if it works so that we can give it to the rest of the aging population and we have the research that we need. So, but that's, that wasn't fair for us because now we are having these comorbidities and these lifelong effects of not only the virus, but other, but being test babies as we call it in our community. So it just takes a lot of community involvement and demanding of more research um, so that we can understand what our lifespan looks like um, and where we are going, because we right now we don't have the answers at all. Yeah, I, thank you. I would add, um, you know, just thank you, Rania, for, for the question. Um, thank you, Antoinette, for that, um, you know, brilliant um, perspective from lifetime survivors. I think, you know, this is a conversation that's happening right now among a lot of us uh, advocates who've been involved in the research for many, many years. You know, what do we do to, to transfer knowledge, and how do we help mentor and um, bring along the next, you know, pool of research advocates and, um, you know, it comes down to money, comes down to funding. There needs to be funding in place for community driven research advocacy because um, we all know the importance of it, right? I mean, I don't, like, we, I don't think we can overstate, you know, how, how it has impacted HIV research from the get-go, um, having people who are actually living with the virus, living, who have lived experience involved in the, in the, design of these studies, in the execution, in the enrollment, in reviewing, you know, even the patient materials, uh, you know, making sure there's non-stigmatizing language. I just use patient, sorry, um, you know, and people first language. So, you know, I think it, it really boils down to money and the willpower and the, you know, um, you know, to do it and to really be committed to it. Thank you. That's a great charge forward, Jeff. So thank you for that final word. Uh, I know that Vincent and Marlene are ready for us to end so that we can move into our break. But before we do, I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Ronald Johnson, thank you so much. Dr. Kwong, thank you so much. Antoinette Jones, Jeff Berry, you brought lived experience, professional experience, advocacy experience, and real passion and heart to this work. And we look, and the committee looks forward to carrying all that you suggested from the HOPE Act to long-term care to models of long-term care that need to be created. We've got a lot of work to do. Jeff Taylor, you're joining our committee. We can't wait to have you join us, but thank you. And with that, we appreciate the questions. We'll continue to call upon your expertise, all four of our panelists, and more. Um, but thank you all. This was a great, great session. Marlene, Vincent, back to you. 
And thank you, uh, Jesse and Alicia, for your inaugural panel uh, for this miracle committee. I really appreciate your framing uh, the launch of this work, and uh, we are excited. We have been listening to the people for a long time, calling for an increased focus around uh, long-term uh, survivors, and so we are grateful that the two of you have agreed to chair us in our work forward. Uh, do you, I did see your hand up and I just wanted to assure you and the rest of the Pacha members, we have, will have plenty of time on the remaining balance of the agenda today for Pacha members to be able to share and hear your thoughts and ask additional, additional questions. Not sure how long our panelists can hang on, but if you can, uh, we certainly want to continue this dialogue and engagement, it is not over. We will uh, take a quick, I will give you full five minutes uh, of your break. And so if you can return, uh, I've got uh, 150, 250, excuse me, on my clock. So if we can come back right at 255, we'll give a full five minute break. And when we return, we will uh, pivot and move on to our next panel. Thanks everyone. Produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services.